Hello, friends, and welcome to the next part of Philippians. I'm going to read from chapter three, the first seven verses. Paul writes, Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it's a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his Spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reasons for such confidence. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. Here's a really important question. How does a person get to heaven? Many people would say you get to heaven by being good. In other words, you get to heaven if you deserve it. It's as though they picture God keeping a book on us, rather like a cash book, with all our good deeds listed on one side and all our bad deeds listed on the other. And then when you die, God draws a line across the bottom of the page. And whichever is ahead, whether it's your good deeds or your bad deeds, that determines whether you go up or whether you go down. Now, if that were true, it would be really horrible for a whole host of reasons, but here's just one. Think of the terrible uncertainty that that would breed. There you are on your deathbed and you're thinking to yourself, oh dear, which is ahead? Is it my good deeds or is it my bad deeds? And it's not as though you get a monthly statement telling you how you're doing, is it? But if that's not the way you get to heaven, how do you get to heaven? I wonder if you noticed as we read from Philippians what Paul writes in verse 3. He draws a contrast between what he calls boasting in Christ Jesus on the one hand or putting your confidence in the flesh on the other. What does he mean by putting confidence in the flesh? Well, broadly speaking, putting confidence in your own achievements. More narrowly, in the context of this passage, uh, Paul's got his eye particularly on religious achievements, religious rituals, and so on. You see, before Paul ever became a Christian, he was very religious. He excelled when it came to religion. He kept all the rules, which meant that, like most very religious people, he had enough morality to keep himself out of trouble, but still not enough morality to get himself into heaven. Why not? because all his religious rule-keeping didn't change his heart. Even though outwardly he observed the rules, inwardly his heart was as corrupt as anybody else's. He was proud, he was self-righteous, and he seethed with indignation and hatred against anybody who disagreed with him. Incidentally, that kind of self-righteous posturing is not confined to religious people. Uh, the amount of self-righteousness that we see amongst secular people in our society is staggering, especially at the moment, the self-righteousness of the self-styled woke, those who have adopted every modern view and say to themselves, we are woke, as for the rest of you, well, and even though our hearts are so full of hatred and violence and antipathy towards everybody who disagrees with us, what does that matter? We're woke, we're superior. Not quite woke enough, one thinks. G.K. Chesterton got it right so many years ago when he said, we are all in the same boat on the same stormy sea. And we might add, we're all being seasick together. We will be a bit more woke when we've woken up to the fact that as the Bible put it years ago, there is none righteous, no, not one, and we all need a rescuer. Now that's why Paul writes about boasting in Christ. 
not saying, look how good I am, I'm woke after all, but rather see how great Jesus is. He's so good that he lived the perfect life I should have lived, but have failed to live. He's so loving that he died the awful death I should have died. He's so mighty that he conquered death, and he's so kind and compassionate and merciful that he shares his victory even with undeserving wretches like me, if only we will have it. That's the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, you get to heaven not by being good enough to pass the exam. You get to heaven because Jesus is good enough to save and to rescue you. Have you ever asked him to do that? Have you ever said, Lord Jesus, if anybody ever needed a savior, it's me, please. Will you be my savior? Will you be my king? Will you rule over this broken, fragmented life of mine and begin to put it back together? Well, where are you, my friends? Where are you today? Are you still putting confidence in the flesh? Or are you boasting in Jesus Christ? Let's pray. Father, we thank you that Jesus is a saviour for people like us. Deliver us from all self-righteousness and help us by your spirit to rest all our confidence in Jesus our Lord. Amen. God bless you, my friends. Bye for now.